I'm Kim Watson, a member of the Science Advisory Board um, for the state. And um, Carrie Jaguer, uh, Vermont University of Agriculture. Um, Kim and I are going to try and flesh out what standards and testing procedures should be in place for a regulated cannabis market with your help. Um, see a lot of familiar faces in the room, but we're still going to send, send around um, an attendance sheet um, just because there is no protocol at, for subcommittees yet, subcommittee meetings yet. Um, we don't want to be remiss if uh, that becomes a standard. And I think um, we'll go around the room real quick and just do do introductions. Um, if that helps, and we'll start with you, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, the well, let's start with you. I'll finish with me, just so you guys know a little more about me. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm a retired worker from Stone Environmental, which was in, in the area. And um, I have been working with the state of Oregon in their protocols for sampling and making sure that we get representative samples for uh, cannabis product, flour, and um, you know any kind of oils and things like that. So um, that's how I got asked by Julie Moore, who used to also work at Stone Environmental, to be a member of the Science Advisory Board. Um, <laughs> my name is Scott Murray. Um, I uh, have a consulting company called Elucidation, um, working right now for Elucidation. Yeah. Um, right now, I'm working for uh, the Group to purchase North East Processing and working on building or bringing that analytical lab back to life. Hi, my name is Keith Griswold. Um, I was I currently run a consulting company called True Measures, but I was formerly of the original Northeast Process Local Testing in the context of hemp. Um, so I'm currently working with Scott to get the Northeast Processing Testing Lab for cannabis off the ground again, um, in addition to a couple of other small processors located throughout the state. Jeff Pepp. Everybody, uh, my name is John Bergatti. I uh, work for a, a small company. We were doing some hemp farming and we're interested in getting into uh, Following the cannabis uh, as that is legalized. I'm Kim Kaufman. I'm we're all together, so small hemp farmers in Worcester. And, uh, we're very interested in moving into cannabis. Jimmy Goldsmith, same thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steph. Stephanie Smith with the Agency of Agriculture. I currently manage the hemp program for the state of Vermont. Uh, Chuck Storrell, me on public affairs. I think Mr. Waring, you're our client. Could be. <laughs> I'm pinch hitting for somebody else in the firm that yeah, was there this morning. Right yes, me too. And I'm Virginia Renfrew, and I'm here today representing the Vermont Campus Trade Association, which consists of the uh, existing and medical dispensaries. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Pistola. I am here uh, from the Vermont Growers Association, and I'm representing the, the not just the illicit, but also one of the equal players across our state of small places. All corners of the market, not just for your services. Great to see you. Uh, Julie Hilbert, I'm a member of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, I'm here representing the Vermont Cannabis Control Board, which I feel like you probably already all know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yep. And I'm Brent Hare, the Executive Director of the Cannabis all right, thanks. And sort of just a little background um, on my end. Um, I'm the director of the Public Health and Resource Management Division here at the agency. It houses the hemp program, but it is a lot of consumer protection quality control program. And it houses a pesticide program, feed seed and fertilizer program. And when asked by the then governor, Peter Shumlin, what a 
consumer protection quality control program would look like for cannabis. Um, we used a lot of the material that was out there, um, was in touch with other states that regulate cannabis, and we came up with the protocol that you see in the hemp rules. But I'm hoping that uh, Kim's experience in Oregon helps us improve those, as well as input from everybody here. And with that, um, let's begin. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Um, so I noticed that you have a lot of um, tests that you're requiring on the hemp, which would be similar to what you'd want to require on mm -hmm. medicinal, uh, not medicinal, but also, I mean, medicinal and recreational. And I think they would both be included once it's a, once it's all on the board. Yeah, they're yeah. going to make just one yeah. universal for both and, and recreational standards. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the list. Is it enough? Do you think it's enough for public health? I mean. So what we did in the hemp program and stuff, always feel free to chime in as well. And it's up there on the screen what we're talking about for people who yeah. are interested. Table one. We okay. wanted to make it not overly burdensome for the producer, but mm -hmm. still protective of public health. I think we've done that, but extra eyes would be extremely helpful. And I wanted Stephanie with the agency of ag. The other thing I wanted to point out is with hemp, specifically nationally and in the state of Vermont, we're required to test harvest lots um, for potency, uh, specifically to meet the definition of hemp. Um, and so that, that's potentially a, a, a little different, um, but not entirely different, because I understand that there is currently a limitation of 30% THC on cannabis um, to be grown. Uh, but that still probably is at the product level and not at the harvest level, even though they might be the same. But anyway, so, but if you triple the flower or whatnot, I mean, that potentially the concentration is greater than what you would collect in the field. So th that is a little, maybe a little different. So I just wanted to highlight that, which everyone in this room probably already knows. <laughs> um, mo you know, most states require that you test both the harvest lot and the crop, you know, the flower, basically. And it depends, yeah, yeah, what what it's going to be used for, mm -hmm. yeah, for, for recreation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it goes right, the flower goes right to the dispensary, and other flower may go right to processors. Or producers. Yeah. I, I think um, the point Stephanie was trying to make, correct me if I'm wrong, stuff, but in the hemp market, we're testing potency for compliance. In a regulated right. market, it's for marketing. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. And it's possible that the flower would, um, at the grower level, it is possible that the grower not test at a harvest stage because that flower would be trimmed up and it's when it's sold that you would want to know what the potency is at that point and not necessarily out of the field where there might be leaves and other um, additional substances that might otherwise dilute what might get sold in a container at the dispensary and or retail level. So, is it not, and this is an open question because I, I, again, I work in the hemp world, um, and I'd be interested in comments is, is whether or not it really is the product that we're testing, and would the grower need to take a harvest sample? Would it be incumbent upon them to do it um, and pay for that service at that point in the process? Am I making sense? I don't know. I feel like yeah. <laughs> they may be able to clarify it better. What, what's the time frame on the testing? Are you testing pre-harvest? Mm -hmm. Are you testing? So for hemp, it's pre-harvest. But I think in a regulated market, it's it's the final product that would need to be tested. Um, you know, depending on your math. Like, we're trying to, uh, I believe, 
I would like to see applied a level of sort of sanity. Like if it is going for extraction, depending on the type of extraction it's going for, you might not see some of the mycotoxin toxin testing. But if it is small whole flower, the microbial um, contamination on the flower is important. But, but this is all stuff that needs to be talked about and fleshed out. Um, I don't want to be the be all and end all. Like I'm willing to be educated here. Um, but that's what we try to do for the hemp folks, just so they weren't having to do a battery and test that, that weren't necessarily going to be protective of public health. Um, so basically we have potency, uh, pesticides, s residual solvents, and microbial uh, contamination. Um, and the moisture up there is, is also important, but less so in a regulated market because if, it, if your moisture is too high, it's going to mold and take care of itself. But, um, we need to do that because in the hemp rule, we said the hemp needs to be tested on a dry weight basis, and we said 13% is dry. It's a less, yeah. But other than that, any, any thoughts on what did you see in Oregon? Well, we really, I mean, we really would focus for recreational on the trim flower and the concentrates, depending upon and the products and infused products. And the real key was is that the laboratories were required to go to the producers with a trained sampler who would sample the flour from these lots. And they could be 10 buckets of flour, could be one bucket of flour. It could all depend upon what the producer is producing. It really depends on what you're bringing to the recreational market. And most of them had their own recreational facilities as well, the, the, um, where you would purchase what they were selling. And, um, it was all about the laboratories who were required to go. The producers could not send their own lots, um, uh, increments of what you were preparing into the laboratory. The laboratory would send out a sampler who was trained in representative sampling, who would determine how many increments to produce and bring back to the laboratory. And they were required to be trained on an eight-hour training day on how to collect the flour, the concentrates, or the products. And that training would include, you know, uh, how to take increments, how to randomize your tests, and, and everything, or you know, your increments so that you were to ensure that to get a representative sample. But the most important part for that was the pesticides. Mm -hmm. Because, we, you know, we know in the markets today and in the facilities today, they're starting to use pesticides. I mean, when they were, you know, when they were growing in the 70s, nobody had to use pesticides or as much as they are today, especially in um, greenhouses and things like that. I've always felt like the pesticide uh, misuse was by far the most important part of the sample. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, heavy metals, it, I, that's in, I'm not really sure. I've never seen a lot of heavy metals. I mean, it, that was important the, for yeah. him because yeah. it, it remediates the soil and we're, we're planting in unknown. It, the indoor grows. Um, you can control the media a lot more, and hemp was grown in fields. And some of those, some of the samples we were seeing highlight. Yeah, yeah. and probably arsenic just because it's natural in the soils in Vermont, or mostly lead. Mostly lead. And I don't know why. Uh, northeast processing folks, has that been your experience as well? Lead and then cadmium. 
actually. Larry um, Cagney, I heard that. Um, so this is what I'll say. This is just hearsay, but apple orchards yes. seem to have that issue. We do know that. Yes. Okay. Um, no, but that certainly makes sense. I mean, you know, in the, the context of cannabis testing, where sampling, um, obviously results can be skewed based on sampling method. Um, I'm just curious, though. Um, so the trained samplers, are they employees of the laboratory? Is that how it works normally? So they're actually hired by the laboratory. So is that built into like sampling? And I don't want to digress here, but is sampling, is that built into the cost of the testing or how is that extra cost? Um, I'm um, not sure if the producers would have to help pay for the samplers to come out. I, I, we didn't really get into the cost I got into more of the certifications of the laboratory in accordance to the Department of Health um, quality yeah. control standards or their, you know, certifications for their cannabis laboratories. And, you know, a lot of the ISO 17025 labs mm -hmm. also, you know, employed the samplers. They, some, there were some independent samplers, but most of them Most work, work for the lab. Yeah. Yeah, just thinking about it from a resource perspective, just this people who run labs, you know. Yeah, and the dispensaries also may have, you know, had connections with the labs and the samplers, and but the dispensaries typically had one lab that they used all the time, and right. right. Yeah. It, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of labs. There were 75, you know, people that showed up on the training facility the one day just because they had, you know, had to do it. Does anybody in the room feel like we're missing anything? I don't mind. Um, one thing to keep in mind uh, that we currently see in the illicit market uh, at an increasing rate and also emerging in adult use marketplaces. And that is uh, the notion of um, basically uh, rehabilitating right, uh, product uh, in, in the process of making it concentrate. Uh, it's often called remediation. Mm -hmm. um, and it is often an outcome, <coughs> this is why I bring it up, for uh, otherwise um, product that fails a test to then find a pathway to market elsewhere. Um, I don't know exactly what the solution is. I do know that other states have are, are thinking about this. Um, so something to keep in mind. So an anecdote would be, I've got a field of raw flour. It fails, say, microbial test, a heavy metals test. Can I then shop around to a lab to get that turned into a concentrate that may or may not theoretically uh, you know, deal with that issue? So like making a distillate out of a failed material? There's a manifest on most flour and product, you know, that is tracking its lot number and its use and its, so I don't know what the hemp market has done in terms of a manifest to keep track of your harvest lot. We, yeah, in the hemp program, we do require um, that records be maintained of um, flour or concentrate moving and where it goes and ends up. Yeah. <laughs> so even if I have a product on the shelf that I've made, if it comes from a concentrate, I, be, I have to be able to, there's trace back entries forward yeah. through records. Now, mm -hmm. we don't maintain those records here at the agency. The individual is required to maintain those records, and they have to be available for inspection when we ask for it. Um, our rules have been in place since May of 2020, so we're just a little over a year into it, and we do a fair amount of compliance assistance with everyone <laughs> um, to let, make them aware of these requirements. Uh, so, so yes, we do we do have that in the hemp program, but to some extent, my understanding is that some of the organic issues can be resolved through a solvent extraction process. I could be wrong. Um, uh, but even if you did do that, you would still have to have a clean record for the concentrate that you make. So if the, if the flour is clean, 
then you make a concentrate. Potentially that record follows that concentrate. Um, but you, you need, we need to have a, a system, or there has to be records that are maintained that show that, it, that the concentrate is linked to a clean crop in the beginning. And if it's not, then you could potentially remediate. You can take that time and spend that money and have that test run again. Um, and that's fine, too, if it is a, a fair remediation step. I don't know, with certain concentrations and exposure limits in the pesticides, there's no... Oh, no, I was yeah. thinking mycotoxins. I wasn't oh, thinking okay. pesticides. And I wasn't thinking heavy metals. I think heavy metals yeah, would yeah. probably you concentrate as well. Yeah. But, okay. but like, a, um, yeah. So if we did yeah. find any of the traditional chemistries as far as pesticides go, it would be a misuse. And the sort of list that we have for hemp really relies on organic products or minimum risk products. Um, they're <clears throat> so all of those active ingredients up there. Yeah. <clears throat> How many other this one? Two. Oh, the, that's what we would that's want to test, test for, for, not what we normally have for use. Uh, yes, that's what we test for. So you only test for 15. Do we, you require um, any of the producers to document their use of pesticides? Sort of the folks who have gone down the path of certifying organic have to document what yeah, they've yeah. used. And that's a pretty good percentage of hemp growers right now. Um, if they are a private applicator, they do have to sort of record their use. And are they certified through the DOF? Organic farmers? Or? A certain number are, but the licensed applicators are certified through the agency of that. So you have auditors that go up? Yeah, field agents, yes. Yeah. And um, our head inspector look at their pesticide storage generally when he visits a farm as well. As does fire safety. <laughs> As does fire safety. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Carrie, the hemp pesticides approved by EPA, uh, like you know, for use on hemp. Are you? What are? I don't think we would add those to the list. Not no no not to this list, but just generally available for use. Yeah. So what do you think? recreational cannabis. I'm sorry, let me finish. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't. Uh, primarily, some of the minimum risk stuff, yes, but the the pesticides that EPA is allowing on hemp are all for seed and grain. Mm. And they do a dietary risk assessment, but not an inhalation. Mm. Um, that study's called something. Did you ever do that study? The, yeah. the, the inhalation not studies? Any. No. No. No, I don't even know the list of EPA pesticides that are approved to go on to hand. Mm -hmm. I didn't think there were any. There are. <laughs> there are, yeah. yeah. Are they bio pesticides? No. Oh. No. No. Because, like I said, they've been evaluated for grain and fiber crop, oh. um, so you can eat them. But those that they're not considering a smokable flower market. Right. So. So the list of twenty-five bees is okay. Is okay. The twenty-five bees are the minimum risk. I know. There's 15 here. Oregon looks for 25. Yeah. No, I've seen the Oregon yeah. and a lot of those you can't get anymore. So it took off the ones that haven't been you for sale think for the you last. Can't get them. No, we're pretty sure. We're pretty sure. We've uh, we've been running a disposal program in the state, and it's been pretty significant. And a lot of it, a lot of those products are gone. Yeah. If it hasn't been registered for sale or use in the last 15 or 20 years, we didn't add it to the list. So where, what labs are they, the state using right now? So for these? pesticides, currently our lab is the only one, but we, how many labs 
or in the round robin stuff? We have, I think it's eight. Eight. Yeah. But we have two, we have, we're certifying labs as well in the state of Vermont. Um, and we currently have two. Uh, and then we have Bale, so the state lab. Um, and then we have a bunch of other labs that are interested, and those include labs at the dispensaries um, that are currently operating. So the Department of Ag is certifying the labs, not the Department of Health? Correct. And that, and um, the accreditation bodies that are doing it, are, are they certified by a particular accreditation program? So we require um, the certified labs to be ISO 17025 compliant. Um, and then we don't necessarily require specific cannabis accreditation, just that they're following 17025 with, with respect to some standard that they have at the lab, or some analyte or whatever. Um, and we actually don't require it. We require that someone either have it or be working towards it. Because we wanted to give a leg up to folks that are entering the system but haven't quite met that bar as of yet. So they have to be working towards it. Um, and we limit those that are working towards 17025 accreditation um, to only testing potency, moisture, and one more, but I can't remember. I think it's pesticides, actually. Yeah. I think it's worth sharing that certification document with, with Kim. Yes, yeah. this is what we're looking at right now, and um, I can share that. I will, I will send that to you. So just out of curiosity, what certification does the VA, the VA, what is it, VA? State lab. You yeah, can say state, state lab. lab. I think, what is the AAL? Is it fail Vermont yeah. Ag Environmental Lab. Yeah. OK. Oh, VL, V A V L. Yeah. Okay. And what require what accreditations do they require for them right now? So that we're we're designing what requirements that the lab will hold, but the lab does environmental work, so they have the National the, Environmental Lab accreditation. Yes, they're moving moving toward the 17025 they're looking for DEA certification as yeah. well um, and we have other certifications for FDA and what's DEA? So the, the drug enforcement. DEA. Yeah, drug enforcement. Drug, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah the, so they're, well that's what I thought it was but just yeah, in case yeah. they wanted to yeah. call it something else. And we're accredited through FDA as well for our dairy lab for the Central Dairy Testing Lab and EPA. So they've really grown there. <laughs> uh, we've always had, our lab started off as a dairy lab. Okay. But yeah, no, I know, yeah. uh, but the one it was here, but they really, is it all in Randolph now? Or? It is, yeah. So the lab was in this building for many years. Yeah. And then we moved to the lab in Waterbury, which was destroyed during Irene. We squatted at UVM for eight years and built a new facility in Randolph. And that's where that's where we are now. Yeah, the QA manager used to work at Stone. Who was that? Dave Crosby. Dave Crosby, perfect. All right. Because we've had so many. Taught him everything he knows. Dave's great. Um, <laughs> Even I noticed he has a really nice uh, Quality management plan. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have a question just about. So, have you given any thought as you as you move through this to what size you're going to allow? What what what? How much are you going to allow a grower or a dispensary to grow in terms of capacity? Because that will affect your testing dramatically. If you're going to have very small grows, mm -hmm. it's very easy to grow and test. It. Yeah, that's not our charge. No. Specifically that so Julie and Kyle and James. Um, they'll they'll be having those conversations. But I was coming what's a sort of in this conversation, um, what's sort of sticking in my head is a sampling and a sampling protocol um, will become important. 
our list isn't too far off. Um, and pesticides are the primary focus for consumer protection. Is sort of well, what's what I would have for bullets. This is as well. Probably the residual solvents as well. And residual solvents from extraction. Extraction. So for concentrates. Now when we want to test um, Again, I think we almost need a HACCP plan for facilities. That's sort of like the critical control point. Because if you're extracting to make edibles right into butter and not concentrating first, um, maybe we're not looking for residual solvents. But if you're starting from a crude oil or a distillate, or yeah, then we should be looking. And I'm like to sort of build in that flexibility, but I don't exactly know how without being right up in everybody's business. Right, what, what's the processors doing, what's the producer doing? I can't remember if they did residual solvents on anything that got concentrated in you know, into a liquid or oil or a... I'd have to look that out. I think that, that yeah. so your, your smokable concentrates, I think, would all need to be tested for yeah. residual solvents. So one of the things that we did for most of the producers and the processors is we created standard operating procedures for the samplers. So the state of Oregon has for free the standard operating procedures for the samples. I don't know if you've seen them. I, no? yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. have a copy of them, but I have worked on them. Yeah, yeah. So we, we help write those. And, okay. And basically it allows you to know how the samples can collect for a flower mm -hmm. and how you produce your increments and stuff like that. And then yeah. each laboratory had to make their own standard operating procedures set up mm -hmm. so that they, you know, because they're the ones who were working really close with the producers, you know, and um, the growers mm -hmm. and what they're, what they're going to put on the market for sale. No, we envision sort of a similar model in Vermont, or would that create too much of a bottleneck? Because if they did move forward with an unlimited number of small facilities, then that's more testing than if it was a few big ones. So having, right. having the laboratory responsible for taking the samples, would that create a bottleneck? I don't know what um, what appropriate how do we put a Vermont stamp like make it ours. Right, right. So what I hear you asking is that would you allow the the growers to have their own samplers? And send them off to a lab uh, versus whether the laboratories had to go out and provide all that service. Yeah. So yeah. in the cost of um, I don't know what's your auditing process look like for bad actors. <laughs> I mean, their enforcement. Yeah, and I think because that puts a lot of burden on you as well. Yeah. Are, are, are you going to go audit these samplers and making sure that they're not just going and picking their one? Right, like they purge the purge this the concentrate a little bit longer that they send in the lab. Yeah. I mean, I, when you have product or a harvest lot that even had any of, you know, pesticides in it over the action limit, mm -hmm. it's destroyed in most cases. Yep. Or even uh, microbial stuff or whatever. Do you think you can <coughs> fix it so that it works? I'm not quite sure what, about who you're going to trust to do that. Yep. Because nobody likes to throw away pot. <laughs> <Right on. laughs> nobody. 
But you can call I mean, it. even when they or in your operation is going to just increase your cost of compliance, yeah. you know, higher and higher. That's probably not a burden you want to lay on the, for all the reasons that you just brought up. It's not, a, not something you want to lay on the producer. It's something you want to control from your side. Yeah, and it really, you know, how big are you allowing these harvest lots to be? I'm not really sure what, you know, and because when you go to get an incremental sample from a table this size, it's, you know, it's quite an effort. We, uh, <laughs> we got a representative sample, sample from a, what, three acre hemp field stuff? And no, yeah. We had way more <laughs> than the lab was willing to take. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, so that's, you know, that's, that's the big picture. Like, how are you going to take, you know, a three acre field and get it down to three buckets of flour to, to yeah. maybe sample? And then not only that, how much of that can you send back to them after it's sampled? Or how do you get to get rid of it all? You know, some of it doesn't, you know, I know in Oregon, some of the labs are having a bigger problem getting rid of all the extra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, you yeah. know, that chain of custody, the verification the custody. is, is our biggest issue, I think. I think we have. Documentation, right. documentation, yeah. documentation, documentation. Even for the sampler, you know, there's there's like number lot numbers and specific weights and mm -hmm. documentation of how they got that representative sample. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, Having not been involved with any of the state audits that you're doing right now, mm -hmm. I don't know how you're doing the hemp documentation. Like, do are there standard operating procedures for the samplers right now? So, we have put together a post-harvest sam sampling guidance, but it's just guidance the, to help people understand how to get a comprehensive sample or, you know, from Represent. representative, <laughs> yes, I'm like, that's not the right word, um, a representative sample. Um, so, so we do have this, and it's it's kind of a recommended practice, I'll admit. Um, that is on the website. Yes, okay. yes. Um, and then we also have um, forms, yeah, also on the website. Uh, so we're running, we're sort of running a trust but verify system in yeah. the camp program. Um, USDA under their what's it called again? What trust? I, I, it's not called that. Just it's a, sort of what we're doing in the program. We trust that folks are doing it right, but we do send, um, we do take random samples ourselves and run them at our lab. So we, so we have post-harvest and we also have pre-harvest sampling um, documents, uh, sampling protocol, sampling form, and then chain of custody form as well. These, uh, a grower, you know, these have to be followed because it's associated with our, um, well, with our pilot program and potentially soon to be state approved plan, depending on. And how is that all? I mean, what's, what's, how's it working? How, how, what's your, it's most folks want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, everybody yeah. wants to. It hemp is a sort of a. Everybody's sort of viewed it as. Um, a, not a gift is not the right word, but um, you know it's the first time yeah. that we've come out of cannabis prohibition is with the hemp market. And folks have been very straightforward and have been trying very hard to do the right thing. Um, the Keith will work for Northeast Processing. If 
70 samples over 0.3, they wouldn't take it. Um, so it was on the producer and the processor, and everybody was sort of doing their best to be compliant. Um, and you, yeah, we have about 70 percent compliance rate relative to the pre-harvest sampling um, and then all of our testing requirements and we're only a little over a year into the program um, and I, I feel like that's pretty good <laughs> um, and that's based on the folks that we've reached out to and we try to get to 20 percent of our registrants in a year you know like but we we, we reach out a lot um, we do a lot of education work with UVM but I think it's going pretty well <laughs> Um, it's primarily like it, it might be failure to test on a contaminant um, and failure to provide a record, but that does we, again we provide compliance assistance um, to help educate folks on the, the complete breadth of what they need to do if they're going to participate in our program. Where some of the producers or growers got into trouble was they'd grow twenty varieties. Mm -hmm of hemp and each individual variety was a harvest lot. And that harvest lot, it was okay to test for one or two, um, but when you were testing for 20, with a full battery of tests, it was cost prohibitive. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Question? Yeah, uh, does Oregon have a percentage in their SOPs for what they use for sampling of uh, either, you know, cannabis or any other product? And so, you know, a uh, percentage of the total allotment. Um, so, for instance, in California, it's like 0.35% of the entire, uh, you know, uh, uh, product, whether it's flour, concentrate, or, or edible, is yeah. to be tested. Because um, we're going to have a specific. It depends on the harvest lot. I mean, what are you talking about in terms of potency or what, what just the percentage of the increments that they need yes. for sampling? Yes. Like, how no. much? Exactly. Yeah, it's all in there. So yes. that's what people the sample, in other words. Yes. Yep. Yep. They tell you what their increments are, how much in the percentage has to be. Yes. So the scale of the lot right. determines right. the amount of material that's collected. Right. However, the lab may then, is that subsampling? That they can do some subsampling. Yes. It and, depends. and then they only test that subsample, so there's still this volume of material left over. Right. Like the lab that needs to deal with, which is what you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. Having those clearly defined, I think, would be advantageous for producers, especially small producers. Right. Yeah, a scale rather than a, yeah. Um, ours is different. <laughs> um, I wanted to, for post harvest sampling protocol, I want to say that we actually might refer to the amount of material that needs to that um, there's a, a fair bit of scale. I don't remember. Um, no, we do collect depending on the size as well. But then we also, I think, acknowledge the fact in here somewhat loosely um, that we don't want to take too much material either and that an individual should be in contact with their lab to understand what it's needed in order to get a, to run a test. Um, yeah. So we might be blending two things into one. <laughs> anyway, this is available on our website. Yeah, I mean, in terms of what your requirements are, it's right on. I mean, there's no difference between that and most of it. So I think for our next steps, um, it, should I track down the Oregon SOPs, or you said you were involved in writing them? I you, have them. You have them. Maybe I um, can even email them to you. Yep. Oh. Send me oh. the Oregon SOPs, Let's and we'll, we'll uh, get them to you. They used to have three. They used to have one for flour and then concentrates and then one for product. Mm -hmm. But then they concluded that it would be easy enough to just put the concentrate with the, with the product. product. Yeah. That makes sense. 
And we'll send you the our lab certification, hemp yeah. lab certification so, sort of document to look at. And we'll think. It is pretty expensive for them to get the 17025 mm -hmm. um, accreditation. I think is that why you guys decided to do that versus I mean, is. is that your continued effort to do? Are you going to continue to do that? So these are hemp labs, and um, some are food labs. Some are food labs. I I think there ought to, ought to be a way outside of that third party sort of certification to. I mean, you can be. ISO certified, it doesn't mean you produce a good result, it just means it's documented. And um, I would rather see a performance standard, but for right now, I think ISO is what we have. No, ISO is probably one of your better ones. Um. And the thing is, as we move this market forward, we're going to need a lot more than eight labs. I know. Oh, yeah. And are you going to have the manpower to do that? So we'll have a state lab, but that will be sort of the regulatory lab. So these are what this looks like. Do you have an HDMI connected on the side of your... Um, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, it's going to have to come down here because <laughs> the cable's not long enough. I was having trouble the other day, though, opening the HDMI. So I notice in a lot of other states, they're mixing tech and THC in their products. Yep. And so would there be a different set of requirements for the mixtures and for Wow. Um, sort of at that point, it's no longer hemp. Right. The product is no longer a hemp product. So that will be up to the control board to decide. I hope to see it. Um, one is a regulated cannabinoid, one isn't. But the mixed products, um, I think the protocol for those. Um, will be an evolution of discussions. We do see a lot of demand and need for mixed cannabinoid flour and concentrates. Um, so what happens to the hot hemp growers then? Can they put their product in play through that or they'll have to be cannabinoid licensed? So that will again be something that um, the control board will have to make a decision on. I know what my opinion would be, but I don't think that's what USDA had in mind when they said you can remediate a hot crop. Right. Um, <laughs> and at that point, like, where do you fit? You've just grown 10 acres. Everybody else is allowed to grow a thousand square feet. Right. Um, what what then? And I know there are folks in the state that are making Delta Eight and Delta Nine out of CBD. The control board will have to be have to decide if those will be allowed into a rec market. Um, we're just working on the lab stuff right now. I think uh, I think those are questions that are more appropriately directed at the commissioners of the board. I'm sorry, I mean, I would love to answer your question, <laughs> but, but it's not my call. I'm curious, that's all. Yeah, yeah. How you handle that? So what do you, can you do right now with him that's over potency? Burn what? destroy it. Destroy it. Compost it. Compost it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, USDA has a provision for remediating crops, but it's more or less destroying the flower and retaining the stock, or there's another opportunity, but I can't remember. Oh, um, biomass. So diluting the flour with stock material to bring it below the 0.3%. Oh, so those are your only two options on the USDA. So you were asking about the percentage and the increments. There is a whole table 
in the back of these SOPs for the um, the size. Are they based on policy set by the health department and or commission in the yeah, these or were, is it set in law? Um, these are all done by the Department of Health. Okay, Department of Health. Okay. I wasn't sure if there was influence by laws. Just curious. <laughs> no, so they, because they have a whole other set of laws on the whole manifest for the harvest lots and how they're documenting that, and there's a whole. Okay. Yeah, that, that's all. But these were done for the laboratories. And I mean, they, at the time, you know, we used a lot of different people to get them mm -hmm. um, into, <coughs> into law. I mean, it was, they are pretty much law, I think. I mean, you have to follow these and document it mm -hmm. for the food, but when you get down to the processing and the increments, the sample size are pretty much. <laughs> and it is all about the batch size. It's acceptable. Can we find out um, sort of the cost of a battery of tests in Oregon? Just so we can um, I probably could find that out. That I think would be worth Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, I actually have some good laboratory contacts mm -hmm. there as well. Yeah. To, that, you yeah. know, Rose City and some other ones that are, both have their own facilities okay. as well as their, their producers. I think that would be important data. Yep. Like they've done a lot of a lot of good work there. And it's yeah, that's the one. That's for flour or usable. They call it now. They don't even call it flour. And then this one is for <clears throat> concentrates, extracts, and product. And I think you mentioned California used a lot of their stuff as well, because the same people were asked by California to help them develop some, but they never got to, down to this detail. Yeah, I mean, thanks for mentioning that. I would add that um, our organization is close with the Humboldt County Growers Alliance, and we're pleased with what California does, and also Oregon. Um, also specifically for microbial count, that's sort of becoming a contentious issue. So mm -hmm. you guys do a good job at that. Uh, we would be interested in Vermont following those steps. But they do require, you know, the training. That's the one thing they say. Yeah. The samplers have to be trained. Mm -hmm. And the, the training has to be documented. They have to know what they're doing. They have to, so here, in, it's always based on. Mm -hmm. The weight the batch weight. And so in Oregon, the labs are the ones that employ the samplers. Um, have you ever heard of any discussion or uh, aware of other states where it's just an industry that arises of its own and they, the samplers are just the industry? <laughs> and you said that they, there were some in Oregon, but then they well, I now think work for the labs. Yeah. But, I, I wasn't sure. Most of them were all labs that yeah. I worked with. Um, they've been revamping it a little bit more because um, they have the training within their own facilities now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they contracted with me to do the training as well, 
and and I'm like, you know, you can train the trainer. I don't need to come here every year because every year you have to document yeah. that these samplers are trained for an eight-hour day, just like if you were doing OSHA. Yeah. You know, you're doing. Um, and so it was really, you know, within their own groups of producers and and processes and laboratories. So I don't know, let's see what they changed. I mean, I think, yeah, this just had to do with quality controls and some of the things that were going on. But that's all available on their website. But I can email these to you too. Yeah, let's, uh Let's yeah. do that and we'll yeah. um, make sure that the board has a copy just so that will be our, our minutes essentially. Yeah, yeah. A couple of documents. Um, in addition to trams, are okay. No, in oh. addition to training, and I mean, in, in addition to testing specifically, is there any interest from the consumer protection world whether or not there should be specific actions that a grower or processor should take in order? Like besides testing, which is important, but like risk reduction in their actual practices. And say that again. Like yeah. so, growers and processors should 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 this program include risk reduction activities? And you mentioned mentioned the HACCP plan. Mm -hmm. um, but is there like should we outline what those are? <laughs> Or suggest that they're that be included for growers and processors so that you under if you that was more or less the triage what tests were needed based on end product. That's right. Yeah, but um, still, but this could just be you know you got to follow these practices and you have to do these tests and then I think we because quality starts before testing. I guess is my yeah, point. and I think we build the gold standard and then put it out for comments. Um, because of the balancing act between we don't want to make um, the regulated product exponentially more expensive than the non-regulated product or we're not going to balance the market. So, so we have to see what the cost is and yeah. what sort of I hadn't even considered the price of having the sample taken. Yeah. Um, that could be significant. If you're um, charging mileage to and from. Mm -hmm. just, just about, well, I think there's a balance here. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it is, but let's build a gold standard which would be all product tested using certified licensed samplers going to certified and licensed labs um, and see what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, they didn't require their samplers to get any type of certification other than the training. documentation of the training. The yeah. And, and so, and as we used to tell them, you know, once you get trained or once your quality assurance person gets trained or a sample mm -hmm. gets trained, they can train the other samplers as long as it's really well documented. Mm -hmm. And they have a training program of some sort. The same way, you know, when NELAP requires you to get ethics mm -hmm. training or, you know, that kind of training on a GCMS or yeah. an HPLC. You have to demonstrate some kind of competency in that mm -hmm. manner. The other sort of thing that could happen is we build the, we have these certified labs, but we do a, a sampling of the product on the shelves to test for all these parameters, and that would not be on the producers, but it wouldn't be every sample. Right, right. Um, it's kind of what we do with our feed and fertilizer programs. Um, and just that sort of enforcement 
presence. Um, ups the quality of product in the state uh, in those particular areas. I do like the idea of having everything tested, um, but if we're dealing with everybody and their brother growing, mo moving their backyard grow to a thousand square feet of um, cans that we can sell. I don't see us getting it tested on it in a timely manner. But we'll build yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like what happened in Oregon, all of a sudden their market crashed because the labs weren't, weren't uh, up and running. I think they've recovered, but how do we avoid that? Yeah. Could it be, I mean, this doesn't solve the problem in the first year or two, but if you, have people who participate in the program and do all the testing and they have a proven track record, then you can dial back. I mean, I guess that's an opportunity to mm -hmm. be a producer that dials back too, but you know, but then it just becomes, I don't know, I'm just thinking of different ways. Yeah, how are you going to limit the cost? And yeah. that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Is, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you're doing it with the hemp program right now, like you said, it, how, how is it happening right now? We require the tests. We require the yeah. tests. And how much is that costing you guys? It's a lot. It's not. It, it, it's expensive. And that's, yeah. and that's with the grower, at least from last year, we didn't uh, grow this year, but uh, taking the samples yourself. I know they're used to yes. be, they had the documentation that you followed, um, so training, but then dropping the, those samples off to, to the lab. Um, requiring the lab to send out a trained you know, sampler will completely understand it from um, uh, the state's perspective, that's going to drive up the cost a lot for the, that the labs will be charging. When, when I say a lot, it won't, won't be any kind of especially here where you have So where do you labs. send your samples now? Up to the state, or do you? No, at any, first any? we were working with a private lab in Waterbury that, I, as far as I know, is accredited by the state. Yeah, there's 17025. And then at, at some at some point we had to deal with a lab that was DEA certified, so that was down in Florida, which obviously would be impossible. To, <laughs> you know, if, if in the event that you decide to go to a level of scrutiny that's uh, where there needs to be DEA certification, I don't think one exists. Mm -hmm. A lab exists in, in the state. I, I'm not sure that one exists in the area. There, there's we have one DEA registered lab in Vermont currently. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I mean it, from the hemp perspective, all labs beginning in 2023 will have to be DEA right. registered for hemp production. My understanding is that. In Oregon, the labs that are certified by the Oregon Health Department are also the la uh, labs that do testing for both cannabis and hemp. And my understanding is that DEA is not going to get in the way of that certification program and the ability for those labs to test for both for both cannabis crops and hemp crops. I, I don't, I'm not in Oregon. I don't know how that's playing out, but um, I suspect we maybe could inquire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see how that's working. That's one of those things I have to, I have to see it to believe. But and, and my only my point was I was only talk, speaking cost, and again I'm over here yeah. behind because we didn't do anything. But um, you know, with that lab before it was not exponentially, but marginally more expensive than the labs here, and you know they had the extra levels of accreditation. Um, so just speaking to cost, everything that we're discussing yeah. is just going to keep driving costs up higher and higher to the farmer. Hey, I have a question. <clears throat> Just on that, do we know how much of the testing is, like exactly how much of the testing is happening out of state right now for him? I, we don't know. Uh, we do know that testing is happening out of state right now. <laughs> the difference is the hemp producers, they could have a tank or field that is one harvest lot and they're required to do one battery of tests, whereas the 
uh, high THC cannabis, you're potentially going to have a thousand square feet every eight weeks. That so you're, and if it's just one variety, then maybe that's your harvest lot. If there's multiple varieties in that grow room, that's multiple harvest lots. So what the hemp producers are required to do once a year. Um, the indoor growers are going to be required to do five times a year at a minimum on every different variety. So we have the hemp grower saying it's expensive to do the battery tests. Um, and, you know, hemp is worth about half as much. It depends on who you're selling it to, but people are still getting a substantial amount for cut flour or for small pool flour. Um, and you're growing 10 acres and it's still expensive. Whereas the high THC, that we're, we could potentially be overburdening with testing. And I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, I don't, I mean, the problem is, is the, I mean, the equipment is so expensive. Yeah, no, I know. I, I mean, that's, that's the, whether you're doing heavy metals or, you know. Yeah. That's that's the big problem for the lab. I mean, one HPL. Keith had his own half million dollar lab just a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. The equipment, the ongoing costs. Yeah. yeah. Not cheap. Costs are, are not cheap. Yeah. yeah. I need to go. I'm so yeah. 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 So so let's think of action items. I'm going to send you those. I mean, we kind of agree that the tests are sufficient. Yep. Um, I'm going to, my action item is to look at some costs of what the difference, I almost think that they've included the samplers in the test costs, you know, because they have to employ the employee anyway, whether the lab is using the sampler for cannabis or water testing, you know, they'll go out and collect water samples too, mm -hmm. maybe charge a little, you know, a little for mileage, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm interested in how many of the labs of the 75 in Oregon are testing beyond cannabis. Because if you have the equipment to do other tests, you're, you know, you're dividing that equipment up amongst many things. And, and I can ask that. Yeah, well. you know, like I'm yeah, wondering yeah. if that feeds into yeah. to the yeah. issue as well. Okay. Because it is the environmental labs that are also inquiring about hemp certification. <laughs> Are there? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, yes, and then, and then, and then, and then. Eurofins, I think, that's yeah. too. Yeah. 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 is a food lab, but they're also building a cannabis lab, or have built. So we'll send you our lab certification. Um, we're looking at you. Uh, you send us the Oregon SOPs and check into what the costs are, and then we'll we'll meet again. Is this going to be a monthly thing? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, for the start, it's going to be. Yeah, cool. yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah and we'll meet again in a week or two. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Let us. Uh, my schedule. My schedules. Is what it is, but we'll Yeah, I'm we'll busy at the, like I said, I think I told you I'm busy at the end of mm -hmm. um, September and mm -hmm. the 1st of October. Yep, no Auditing problem. Auditing labs. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. All right, so, so we are done for today. Okay.